All right, let's get started like we normally do. Short period of bell meditation. Wherever you are behind your avatar, please get into a nice meditation posture. And as I ring the Qing bell, the idea, just focus on the sound of the bell. Really get that deep listening going. Uh, you'll probably get distracted. When it happens, just gently remind yourself and go back to focusing on the sound of the bell. Then there'll be, of course, the three recitations, and then on with the talk for today. So I'll give you a moment, get into a nice posture, and we'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. Once again, greetings, everybody. It's Monday, it's the Deer Park, it's the Buddha Center. Here we are. So today, we're going to talk about the Malakirti, uh, sometimes known as the lay bodhisattva. So a lay person that traveled the bodhisattva path. Or, as I say to you guys, he was a bodhisattva in training. But he actually seems to have taken it that next uh, step and gone beyond training. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so there's the Sigalavada Sutta, which you guys hear me talk about a lot. And in that particular sutta is found one of the few examples 
where the Buddha actually speaks directly to a lay person about Buddhist practice. And in the Vimalakirti Nirdesa Sutta, they introduce a layman whose selfless thoughts and actions reveal himself to be a bodhisattva in training and then on to be a bodhisattva. Uh, his knowledge of the middle path and his intense ability to keep mindful, right, to be mindful, uh, intimidates even the most mature disciples of the Buddha. So kind of an interesting character, this Vimalakirti. So the, the Vimalakirti Nerdesa Sutra teaches that the Bodhisattva ideal of the selfless hand, or acting selflessly, is a path to liberating both oneself and others from unsatisfactoriness, discontent, and anguish, or as we like to call it, suffering. This is a teaching with a message of social engagement that's based on the core Buddhist, Buddhist principles of compassion and generosity. The act of responding with effort, vitality, and commitment to those in need without expectation of reward reveals the highest of ethical characters. Any Buddhist study and practice must not begin and end with a quest for an enlightenment experience, because to stop there is the act of a selfish human being. So we don't want to get into Buddhism, right? We don't want to be on the noble path simply because we want that enlightenment experience, whatever that may turn out to be. Right? We want a higher goal than that. We want to be selfless. So a selfless human being reaches past all that, and they're looking for that higher level, that higher goal, one of extending generous and compassionate hand whenever and wherever it is needed. Sounds like the description of a bodhisattva in training. Now, the translation that I'm using uh, when I'm quoting from the sutra today is all done by Robert Thurman. And you can look up who that is. He's a very famous Buddhist and scholar, wrote a lot of books, a lot of stuff. So I used his translation because it seemed to be the more contemporary. It had a, a nice flow to it, I guess, if you will. So from the sutra, here's a quote. His virtuous application, by the way, when I say his, we're talking about Vamalakirti. His virtuous application is tantamount to his high resolve. His high resolve is tantamount to his determination. His determination is tantamount to his practice. His practice is tantamount to his total dedication. His total dedication is tantamount to his liberative technique. His liberative technique is tantamount to his development of living beings, and his development of living beings is tantamount to the purity of his Buddha field." Unquote. A lot of stuff there. But here's the deal. Vimalakirti was just an ordinary layperson whose life became a model of the bodhisattva way of being. When the Buddha offers, Vimalakirti chooses not to pursue the monastic life. The Buddha actually came to Vimalakirti and said, you know, you're ripe for this whole monastic thing. And he went, nah, not interested. Instead, what he does is he applies the ideals of human excellence to the reality of his daily secular life. Spirituality joins altruism and generosity as facets of how he chooses to be. He is offered as representing the ideal layperson because he is a Buddhist 24-7, 365, he takes no days off. And this describes a lay person of the middle path who lives the bodhisattva ideal, that is truly working at being a bodhisattva in training. His commitment to virtuous thought and action and his determination to liberate others by aiding them in their wholesome personal development is the example he sets for others. So here's a new term we're going to throw in today. I talk to you guys a lot about setting an example, be an example. And we talk about it right now with wearing masks because of the pandemic. Just wear one. Be an example. Well, there's a term for being that example. It's showing the purity of your Buddha field. 
it's it's saying i look around me i am on the noble path and i do that as an example view the concept then of buddha field as that interconnective force that exists between yourself and other human beings and the world you live in how you choose to be directly affects the strength or weakness of your buddha field so think of it as example as when you're being that example if you are mindful and you're being say generous then that extends the wholesomeness of that buddha field you do the opposite it shrinks it up right it makes it less effective and if we look at that quote from the sutta it's just saying here that Vimalakirti has high resolve, and that gives him determination, and that, uh, that strengthens his practice, makes him more dedicated, helps him with his technique to liberate himself and others. And it helps him develop that better character in other human beings. And because he's helping others and being that example, well, that's the purity of his Buddha field. There's another passage from the sutra that describes a part of the Malakirti's what they call virtuous application, meaning he's just a good guy. Here's it is, quote, His wealth was inexhaustible for the purpose of sustaining the poor and the helpless. He observed a pure morality in order to protect the immoral. He maintained tolerance and self-control in order to reconcile beings who were angry, cruel, violent, and brutal. He blazed with energy in order to inspire people who were lazy. He maintained concentration, mindfulness, and meditation in order to sustain the mentally troubled. He attained dis dev decisive wisdom in order to sustain the foolish." Unquote. Pretty powerful passage, but it speaks again directly to being a bodhisattva in training and eventually a bodhisattva itself. Because this passage reveals that Vamalakirti had mastered the six refinements, generosity, morals and ethics, tolerance and acceptance, vitality, meditation, and wisdom. So he had, he had refined all those to such a point that he could use them and they just became part of how his character was. Now, the last three, vitality, meditation, and wisdom, are traditionally and, and often even today are said to be practiced only by monastics because they were considered the type of practice that because of what lay people had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that they couldn't possibly experience these things to the depth that would be needed to actually be say a bodhisattva right uh, their energy for example would be sapped by their daily routine so they didn't have the extra energy to put into their spirituality for example or they're so busy they don't have time to meditate or look they just don't have the time to study and practice so it's very difficult for them to build their wisdom now this is was a traditional way of looking at it and unfortunately there are some folks that still look at it that way today but not only did Vamala Kirti master these things for his own wholesome personal development but he took that next crucial step, the step of the engaged Buddhist, by offering his altruistic hand out to others with equanimity. The Malakirti's story is one that is meant to empower lay people. And, hey, monastics too. Because this is the knowledge that walking the path of the Bodhisattva is achievable by all. Now, notice we're saying walking the path of the bodhisattva. Becoming a bodhisattva, that can be pretty hard, right? But according to Vimalakirti's experience, it can be done. One just has to realize their own Buddha nature, or even their purity. Now, in the beginning of the sutra, the awakened one, the Buddha, 
he asked that his closest disciples, Ananda and Saraputra, and some others, to go to the home of Amalakirti and speak with him. Just go and have a chat. Well, egos arise. And they choose not to go, Ananda and Saraputra, because they've heard that Vimalakirti's knowledge and practice are really good. He really knows a lot. And he really has a depth of practice. So they fear that this Vimalakirti will ask them questions that they're not going to be able to answer. And here they are, close confidants of the Buddha, big-time disciples. And they're afraid that this layperson will ask them difficult questions. Well, the sutra tells that in hearing this, a group of bodhisattvas, including Manjushri, said, hey, we'll go. We're not afraid of him asking questions because we, we're there, right? We are bodhisattvas. So they attend to the home of Vimalakirti. And there, Manjushri questions Vimalakirti on living the bodhisattva ideal. And here's this ordinary guy gives them answers that could be understood by anyone, from the most experienced to the most ordinary. So we're going to go over those, some of those questions. Manjushri will be the questioner, and Vimalakirti, of course, is answering. One of the questions, what is the great compassion of a bodhisattva? Vimalakirti answers, it is the giving of all accumulated roots of virtue to all beings. In short, willingness to give forth my merit, right? My skills, my wealth, material goods, my time, right? I'm willing to give away these accumulated roots of my own virtue to all living beings. Pay close attention to how many times the, the term living beings is used and consider what we talked about on Friday. Manjushri's next question. What is the great joy of the Bodhisattva? It is to be joyful and without regret in giving. So this is all about generosity, right? It's saying a Bodhisattva will give without any regrets. They'll just give when it needs to be done, and that's it. It'll make me happy, at least for a time. Next question. What is the equanimity of the Bodhisattva? Meaning, how does the Bodhisattva balance what they're doing? And Vimalakirti's answer is, it is what benefits both self and others. Whoa, now here's an interesting line. A Bodhisattva is supposed to be out there, say, to help you and me find our way to liberation, right? They've already found their way, and they've decided not to go, but they're going to help us go. Right? That's kind of the general idea. But here, Vimalakirti says, yeah, but the things that I do, I do for the benefit of myself and others. So it's okay to include ourselves, right? Because we want to progress. We want to develop. Hello, Moira. The next one. Again, it's Manjushri. Where should he who wishes to resort to the, magnam the magnanimity of the Buddha take his stand? So basically, if somebody wants to follow the Buddha, what is one thing that they must do? So Malakirti says he should stand in equanimity toward all living beings. So he should see all living beings as, if not equal, very close. Manjushri again. Where should he who wishes to stand in equanimity toward all living beings take his stand? Meaning, what does he want to do with all these living beings? What is his goal? Well, Ramalakirti says he should live for the liberation of all living beings. That should be his goal, right? Everything he does should in some way, shape, or form head for that goal. Manjushri again. What should he who wishes to liberate all living beings do? 
Himalakirti says he should liberate them from their passions. Basically, I like to look at that as teach them how to deal with the emotional phenomena that plagues them all the time as human beings. Start there. Manjushri, how should he who wishes to eliminate passions apply himself? So what should, basically, what do you do for Malakirti? And he says, well, they should, he, in the sutra it says, he should apply himself appropriately. Interesting that they use the word appropriately when they could have just used the word rightly also, because this points toward, if we want to eliminate passions, we apply the Eightfold Path. Right? And we look at view and intent and speech and action and livelihood, mindfulness, effort, and concentration. That's how we apply ourselves appropriately. And then he asked, how should he apply himself to apply himself appropriately? And basically, what should he do to do that? And Vimalakirti says he should apply himself to usefulness and productiveness. So the things he does should be useful in the liberation of others and be productive in the liberation of others and self. In other words, he needs to be pragmatic. Do what needs to be done so we head toward the goal. So in short, Vimalakirti offers that to practice Buddhism, that to be that bodhisattva in training, is to give freely of one's resources and skills and time to liberate all beings, including the not-self, from suffering, discontent, and anguish, or suffering. There's an a author and scholar, his name is Charles Luck, and uh, he has a book called Ordinary Enlightenment. Interesting book. In there, he, this quote, and he's talking directly about the Vimalakirti, Nirdesa Sutta. He says, this sutra is particularly applicable to Western students of Buddhism because it teaches that people in the secular life, or layperson, can practice Buddhism as effectively as members of the monastic communities, unquote. Key word in there can practice Buddhism as effectively as members of the monastic communities. Not the same way. They're not being a monk or being a monastic. But their practice within their sphere of life is as effective as a monastic's experience. Not the same, but just as effective. It's just like you can take a bicycle or a moped to work. One's a little faster. One, you don't get as much exercise, but they're both effective in getting you to work. You just pick which one is right for which situation. Now, in the sutra, the Malakirti is also one of equanimity because his practice of generosity, man, it spanned all the castes. Remember now, we're talking about India, and we're talking about the caste system, and it was, it's been entrenched for many thousands of years. But this was revolutionary in the culture of that time, that he was just as willing to interact with the Dalit class as he was with the Brahmin class, or caste, if you will. His compassion and altruism were not limited to members of his own station in life. And in the caste system, that's kind of the way it's supposed to work, is you only involve yourself with the people of your own caste, as far as, you know, making friends or getting involved with them, say, uh, educationally or whatever. So this is what it says in the sutta. Quote, wanting to save people, Vamalakirti used his excellent skillful means to reside in Vasali, where, with wealth immeasurable, he attracted the poor, with the purity of his morality, he attracted the miscreants. With the modernation, mo modernation of his forbearance, he attracted the angry. 
With the great exertion, he attracted the indolent. With single-minded concentration, he attracted the perturbed. And with, definite, with definitive wisdom, he attracted the foolish. Unquote. So think about that. Each one of those things are, are basically refinements, right, when, when we look at the refinements. So wealth, generosity, his generosity attracted the poor. His morality attracted the miscreants. You know, the people that did wrong, they say, wow, this guy's pretty good. Maybe I should uh, use him as an example. So you can look at each one of those and see the six refinements. Moderation is tolerance and acceptance. And with this, he attracts the angry. Now, it doesn't take living the monastic life to live the bodhisattva ideal. And it doesn't take the walls of a monastery to engender the bodhisattva ideal. All around you are opportunities to engage your Buddhist practice. All around you are opportunities to be a wholesome agent of transformation. Offer your time and your skills maybe to a local organization. Uh, look for a group or a cause that you have interest in and that is doing positive work in your community. Volunteer what time you can. Volunteer what skills you can. Doing so probably is going to require that you get out of your comfort zone on occasion. But that too is part of the practice. You become part of a social network of people with a like determination to do good for others, kind of like what we do here twice a week. But in the end, it really doesn't matter if it's a Buddhist organization or not. If you're out there helping others, helping yourself, you building a more wholesome personal character, you being an example to others to do the same, then that's really what we're looking for. Buddhist or not, if we're moving us toward human flourishing and the alleviation of suffering, Buddhism or not, it's a good thing. So Vimalakirti then is put forth as this idea that a lay person can have just an effective a Buddhist practice as someone who spends their whole life in a monastery. Personal experience tells me that if you can be a bodhis if you can live the bodhisattva ideal, if you can practice being that bodhisattva in training in the midst of your normal layperson's life, in some ways I think it has more power than what a monastic can do from a monastery. Because people see you living the same basic kind of life that they're living, but you're doing it in such a different way, maybe, than they are. You've chosen this path that says, while myself is important, and I know that, and I work on that, I also know that others are equally important to me. So, I am equally willing to help others as I am willing to help myself. In whatever method is needed to do that. Of course, we look at skillful means, you know, do we have the ability and the resources and the permissions to do these things, but we're still willing to do them. We're willing to be that example. And when you look at the bodhisattva ideal, in the end, that's what a bodhisattva is, an example an example to others in how to reach the alleviation of suffering. So every chance you get, be that example. Be that example in the small ways and in the big ways. And I, at the danger of repeating myself too much, during this time of the pandemic, this is really a time that you can show that bodhisattva in training ideal. This is when you can really practice it because there are so many opportunities for us to give of material goods or give of ourselves, our time, 
but even more importantly than any of those is again being that example of doing what's needed to be done to protect others and to protect yourself. So I say it again, wear the mask. If you're outside the house, wear the mask. If you're with a group of people, maintain physical distancing. And remind others, gently. You don't have to, you know, be angry about it or defensive about it or offensive about it. You might just say, I'm wearing this mask to protect you. Would you please consider wearing your mask to protect me? Sometimes that's what it takes. And those little things, that little example, once this pandemic passes, and it will pass, that's the kind of thing that will stay in people's hearts and minds and maybe help them make little changes as they go on, make more positive changes. So you can be the Vamala Kirti of your neighborhood. You might not have his money, but you got his passion. You've got his goal. And you've got his path. All right, questions, comments. <laughs>